she well, my, my mother was a um, high school headmistress. Um, <laughs> so the only smarts I have are from, are from her. She's you know, a very clever lady. And um, so I was lucky. I was the laziest student, the most terrible student of all time. I'm really appreciative of you coming here this morning because we've tried once, mm. my mistake, <laughs> and then I actually wrote you wrong. This, I, I, I used the name of somebody else who's also built like you. I was a bit worried. It could have been. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a problem. I'm always up in the morning. So. Yeah, yeah. What time do you get up in the morning? Um, recently, I've been going to an early class, so uh, about 4.45. Tell me, Adam, when were you born? Where? In, yeah. in Melbourne, in, in Australia. Melbourne. Okay. Yeah. Do um, you have siblings? I do. I have a, a sister who's living in Brisbane, which is where I grew up. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, my father was in the army, and this is the time of the Vietnam War, and he was moving between bases in Australia. Are you, you guys really close? Mm, because of my career, not so much. I mean, in terms of physically, so it's if, oh, in, yes. you can't live as much as I have in Japan. And, I see. And for that case. Right. So your father, your father and mother still doing well? My father's passed away oh, um, uh, some time ago, and my mother's still living in in Australia, in near Brisbane. In the and your sister too? Yes, in Brisbane. In the right. okay. And she's made you an uncle. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> As you made her an aunt. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, that's the, so tell me, so moving around as a kid, what was it like? We call it military brats. Yeah, it was sort of like that. It, it, it had benefits and, and um, challenges, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember watching the moonshot um, as just a group of three before going off to primary school. Um, uh, living in those married quarters and eventually my mother said to my father that's it you can keep going to you know bases and, and but we're gonna buy a house and we're gonna live there so we, we having gr been born in Melbourne we I grew up in Brisbane we stopped and that we bought a house in Brisbane and which I stayed in until I was 20 so from essentially although we moved several times before I was four from four to twenty, I, I lived in Brisbane and grew up and went to school in Brisbane in Australia, which is in the kind of in the middle in the north. Australia's a big place; it's the same size as the US, so it's four thousand kilometres or two and a half thousand miles from from north to south, from south to north, and it's six thousand kilometres wide. So it's it's a five-hour plane trip from Sydney to Perth. So it's a big place. Yes. Japan fits in twenty-seven times. Um, so Brisbane's in the, in, the, in the middle, but that makes it fairly close to the equator. And Why does everyone think it's so small? Everyone yeah, people think, oh, I'll go to Brisbane, then I'll go to Melbourne, right, and in the right, afternoon right. I'll go to Sydney. Right. And it's, there are a thousand kilometres between Cairns and Brisbane, Brisbane and Sydney, Sydney and Melbourne, Melbourne and Adelaide. There's a That's thousand right. kilometres between each of those cities. Is the area in between there called the Outback? Um, the, the, the middle bit is the, the middle outback, bit's called essentially. Outback. I mean, anywhere you go that's not the city. In, not and the and city. Australia is, you know, um, all coastal. very much coastal. Very much. There are I, I, I central um, cities, not many, um, but uh, very much coastally aligned and very large clumps of cities, which are the major population. There's 27 million people in Australia. Two of the cities, Melbourne and, and um, Sydney, account for nearly 10 million. So mm -hmm. half the population live in two cities, which are on the coast. So. Wow. Yeah. My goodness, so you, do you ever plan on going back to live? Yeah, um, there's a place in, in near Brisbane. We have states like the US, the northern state is called Queensland, because um, we're from the, the British colony, the same as you guys. Mm -hmm. so, so we have Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, pretty, pretty colonial names. Uh, in Queensland is a place called the Gold Coast, which has a, a, a beach strip called Surface Paradise. Uh, and there's about 20 to 30 kilometers of white sand beaches there, which is the best in the world. I mean, I've seen most, yes. um, and it is by far uh, the, the most beautiful beach trip in the world. And it's a yes. lovely place to live, and it's very temperate. Yep. My children grew up here in Japan for various reasons. But I was here from year one to year 12, pretty much, year two to year 12. America, um, ASIJ, sorry, um, Nishimachi, Nishimachi right. followed by ASIJ so from ten. year 10. Okay. Graduated, went to work, uh, to do whatever they liked to study, which was computer science and graphics and things like that. And you had two kids? Two kids, yeah. And it's on, on the Gold Coast. 
with a, with a car I gave them in an apartment that, that I paid for by the beach, living my dream. Right. That's what I want to do. And I, you know, the surfing and the, and the, the lifestyle and get around. They did. Um, but that's, in the future, I would probably want to go back there, temperate. Is that where they are now, your kids? No, no, they're both in Japan. They both came back here. Yeah. Right. As soon as they graduated, they were back here within a week or so in jobs. I mean, okay. that's, that's the, the benefit of being... So, now, you is know. your girl or is your daughter older? Is yeah, Momoko son? is, the is older. Yep. And then your son? Yeah, Sean is younger. Yeah. Right, right. Are you the one that married? Both. Uh, yeah, um, my son is married is and, and my daughter is married and separated. So. Okay. Oh. So, t- so, I know you know a lot about Australia because you work for the government. Yes. So I started with our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is like the State Department in the US, um, when I was just 20. I, I finished my university degree fairly quickly. I was, there was a system in place where you could start school when you were five, four when I was young. So I was in year one when I was four. So I, gradua- I graduated high school at 15, started, 15. University, started university at 16, did an honours degree, was done at 20, joined Ministry of Foreign Affairs, was on my first posting here in Japan when I was 21. Wait, wait. Was this because your, your mother, your father, who was, who was pushing you? <coughs> well, my, my mother was a um, high school headmistress. <laughs> okay. um, so the only smarts I have are from, are from her. She's you know, um, a very clever lady. And um, so I was lucky. I was the laziest student, the most terrible student of all time. But um, I received some of her gifts, so I was able to... Um, you read at a very early age, probably. Sorry? You read, read Oh, yeah, at a very yeah. Early uh, age. Before I went to school, before I went to kindergarten, I could read and write. That's the thing. Most yeah. kids don't. Yeah. So, and, and I remember sessions with her she'd hold up a cart nose is not toes or whatever it might be and i'd be right. reading there's a three or two or do you st- are you still an avid reader do you like to read a lot i do um i i romanticize that i'm a book reader but these days if i'm carrying one i'm very lucky um i like i, I strangely enough of all of the i and maybe it's an escape from the, the hard reality of economics and politics that i do i like y- young adult fiction can you believe Harry Potter, that type of thing? There's nothing wrong with it. It's um, written by adults. It's 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 you know um, Alex uh, Ryder and and these types of stories, black and white, beautiful, clean, good, happy endings. You know, why not? That's so. I I, I, I have a big collection of those, but what I find myself t- torn whether I'll read something on an iPad or actually carry the book. So bag doesn't fit in the bag much anymore. But. But I, I you, love what about read. books on tape? No, I don't do it. Don't I, do I like to read. I like to read. Yeah. So for Harry Potter, I read all seven books in Japanese and in English. Um, oh, so you're fluent in Japanese as well as? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'm probably better than my crappy English. It depends. Um, so I, I learned you know, uh, Japanese at school, at university. Studying with, so studying in, in college? In, in, no, no, no. In, in year eight. Year eight. So I, I did Japanese from year eight. I added Chinese in from year ten. Um, I was doing Latin. Can you believe? At the same time as that. So in, in in the school I went to, I was very fortunate. Once again, I was a military brat. They hold places open, and my parents sacrificed so I could go to a private school, um, which I which I at the time hated, because from my, my primary school, from the the the. the the year one to seven school. Of the 150 in the year seven class, only two went to a private school. So I wanted to go with all of my friends to the local yeah, yes. state school, you know, the, the public school. Um, but th- thankfully, um, my, my parents they had, knew better. because the, these, in Australia, the, the, it's like this, the US, you have, you're, when you're born, you go on the waiting list to go into these private schools, but they hold places open for diplomats and for military families. So I was able to go. And I was a terrible student, but um, luckily, by the time I got to year 10 and things get serious for university entrance, I'd mastered it a little bit. And I was doing subjects that I liked, I Japanese, Chinese, economics, modern history, um, English, and advanced maths, because everyone had to do advanced maths at that What that interest do you think of an Asia, Asia take? Well, the first point was that I was pretty poor at science and geography. So doing Asian languages as, a, as one of the subject choices, which I found very easy. Um, Chinese and Japanese. We're pioneers on the Chinese side, in particular at our school in those days. 
people learning Mandarin um, was kind of unheard of, and even Japanese. It was only in all of Queensland, which had 18 or 20,000 students in year 12, 80 studied Japanese. And what are you talking about, 1980s, 1990s? This is so uh, 75 to 79. 75 to 79. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I, I finished with, I mean, there were, there were literally 10 students in the state studying Chinese when I finished. So compared to the 20,000 who were doing physics or chemistry or whatever, I, I was in a very small minority. Um, but I had kind of had an idea that even then that you know, maybe Japan is particularly from Queensland, which had a big tourist and, and economic, economic influence from Japan. Well, Japan was buying a lot in Australia yeah. at that time. Yeah, and, and still, so the still, still a major, the top three investors in Australia. So it wasn't really prophetic and it wasn't really, but it was it, the influence of, of Japan in Australia and Queensland in the north was palpable. And what about what about a manga? Did you get involved with that? Uh, Funnily enough, when I went to university, and once again, I was a terrible student at university. Now, when you say you keep on saying you're a terrible student, what's terrible to you? Oh, well, I mean, not in grades terms. I was still a, a okay. what do you call it, an AE, or an a high distinction degree, right? student, right. but I never went to class. Well, I went to class uh, under sufferance. I was always late with the homework. I was always picked on for not knowing what's going on in the class and stuff like that. But, because, you, always because good, but you always got an ingredient. In, in, I was a swatter. I could, I could catch it up. I could, but the languages were kind of a natural thing for me, so that was all right. Um, and for economics and, and politics and philosophy and all the other things I tacked onto my degree, I, I, I kind of did it in the spare time. So I like to do sports. So, um, what kind of sports? Um, at that time, I uh, was a, a football, soccer, a football association football player, soccer player, um, and turns out I wasn't so bad. I, I signed a, a contract for a, a professional contract when I was 15 or 16, um, but I was in the second division, right, as you are, the young player. Uh, turned out a couple of years later, we were playing the, one of the, the, the bigger groups of six division guys, and um, I got a broken ankle. Um, which put me up for six months. I, I, I recovered, but by the time I'd recovered and started to play again, it was time to make a career decision. So do you join the State Department or the, you know, the Foreign Affairs Department and go to Canberra, which is like Washington, in the middle of nowhere, only with public servants, um, or do you pursue other dreams? So of course I went for my career, and I, I played a little bit there, but then I almost instantly went to Japan, and that was the kind of end of me being a professional soccer player. Was yeah. it difficult for you to get in? No, you, you said it was easy for you. Academics were very easy for they you. Take, right? They take about 20 graduates each year so from, from the whole easy. of the... So it's not easy, no. That's um, what I thought, it wasn't and, easy. And so. they're, they're looking for a particular... Depends on what they're doing. Sometimes they want international lawyers, sometimes they want linguists, right. sometimes they want... Right. Just depends what they who's, are. Who's, 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 but, the, yeah. but the, yeah, the hurdles high to get into Minister of Foreign Affairs. Okay, your father, did he, was he career military? Yes, he was. He was. Um, How many years did he stay? Oh, he 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 had two tours in Vietnam, and he also into. We had in Malaysia some action for Australians in that at that, that time as well. Um, he, uh, he was a not a commissioned officer, he was a non commissioned officer. I don't know if you know what that means. He was a, a sergeant major. Um, in fact, he was the RSM, the regimental sergeant major, for okay. in the, in the regiment that he finished in. Okay. So. The, the, those are the guys who are disciplinarians, who are professionals, professional soldiers. Um, and I, I guess I, that was part of my life as well. The did you ever think that you'd go into the military? I did. Were um, you in the military? No, I, did, I thought I would. Because so one of the options looked at to go to university was the, um, we call Dun Troon, which is like, uh, you have a mili mili famous military academy in the US, um, West Point. West Point, okay. it's, it's the West Point of Australia. Okay. So I thought, but they didn't offer Asian languages at that time. And that's something you really wanted. And I wanted to pursue that. Okay. It was a choice. I mean, I probably could have got in. Um, uh, the right sort of profile, military family, um, reasonable, ac pretty good academics. I think we, 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 we had a university entrance score in those days. In the UCAP SAT, right, which is 1600 or something. Right, right. So we had a, a, t a tertiary entrance score, which is 990. So. If I equated it, I probably got about fifteen hundred and forty or something like that. So I could have I could have picked anything to go into, but I wanted to do languages. But you know, in the humanities, the the bar's so low to get in. I could have stopped after year eleven and got in. <laughs> but I, I wanted to do humanity, uh, humanities, essentially economics, um, um, uh, politics. They called it, which is sort of political science. Um, and uh, Japanese and Chinese. There's only one university which will, could allow me to schedule the Japanese and the Chinese at the same time. 
So I went there, uh, I went to Canberra uh, where our Ministry of Foreign Affairs was after I graduated, instantly joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and within one year because some guy here had had a drink driving charge. Well, diplomats don't do that, they just go home, right? Um, there was an urgent call. So I was here on the ground as a 21 year old diplomat, which is kind of unusual as well. I mean, most people need to do their masters and doctorate and they're like 26 or seven when they start. I was the youngest, um, in in my profession for a long time. Before. How many years? How many years were you here? I was here. Um, so th- uh, the first each posting's like three years or four it's, years, it's, depending. It's, so three years. So uh, and and the the amount of Japanese linguists still these days is small um, mm. it, for most countries, but but for Australia the same. There was a a dip in the way that Northern Asian languages were mm. were taught. Yeah. For the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I had three postings here. So 85, Consecutive? 90, no, 85, start point, 85, 90, 98. Mm-hmm. So I, I kind of went back and forth, and we had two or three years in Canberra or two or three years in Sydney, depending on the office we're in, in between each of the postings, and then we back to Japan. Um, now you're saying we, is it? Your family? Yes. We, we, how we? Which posting did you get? No, I know your wife told us because she yeah, did a she, podcast too. On the, on, the first <laughs> po- on the first posting here, like many young um, so you were 20? 20, 21. 20, I was, by the time we got married, I was 20, it, was, it was 86, so I was 23. Okay. From 2002 to, to our, uh, I think in the US you call it your commerce department. So it's, mm-hmm. it's um, uh, Japan has JETRO. Right. In, Aust- in Australia, we have Austrade, which is the the, the, tra- the the trade and investment promotion agency. So you're basically, what's your job there? So uh, so that that was in 2002. So okay. it's the national body which promotes investment and trade, uh, promotes trade outwards to Japan and promotes investment inwards to Australia. Um, uh, and I was in charge of the office here two times in a row between 2002 and 2007 um, doing that. I had to go backwards in my career a little bit to make that jump, but I thought that's where I'm going. Um, so I was happy to do that, um, and it was the beginning of the never say never um, phase of my life. In that, you know, I, I'd had I was well, I was eighteen years in the in the equivalent of the State Department. I'm ready to to maybe be a senior officer somewhere. You know, they always send you to Fiji as the deputy ambassador or something like that. Okay. But you know, you, you, you got the scale. Right. So I had to make a big choice, and I ch- jumped over one of the, the senior trade guys here said, "Come work for us." But I don't think so. He said, no, no, come and have a. So I, I, I did that, and I was I felt sick every day because I didn't have a clue what I was doing um, until I learned it um, from the ground up. Um, and turned out I was pretty good at it. So and 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 using my Japanese as well. So I got another another seven years in a row there, in, in working in the embassy still, but in a different department. Um, now I've gone fifteen years in in in, in living in Japan and. and um, uh, but you know, you're still with the State Department. Yeah, that was no, well. It's part of in Australia. It's a complex relationship. So it's separate. The commerce, the the Oz trade is like Jetro is separate to Meti here. It. So, so we have Meti so, and Jetro. So the times you stay, the time that you have to stay here is based upon you. Yeah, um, it's no longer government. It was, no, it was still government. So, but it was mean? it was the position is hired locally. But it was um, uh, an Australian-based position, so I'm still employed as an Australian, posted overseas. I just happened to be here. But there's no limit. Um, there, there were three again, three to four year connections. But by the time the second one finished, um, it was the second of my never say never points, where one of the companies I've been helping um, said, "We want you to run our operations here in Japan." Um, it was very. Un- it's a very unusual story. Um, uh, you, 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 Australia unusually has a very large casino machine manufacturing company called Aristocrat Technologies. Right. Yeah. Aristocrat Technologies is um, uh, one of the largest suppliers of people called poker machines. Right? Okay. Um, but these days it's very it's much more than, there's none of this. It's these days it's button. this and it's, it's all the math. Um, right. and, and, um, but they're a very large supplier across the world, you know, ranked in the top five. And they were here in Japan. They wanted to set up here in Japan. They were here already in Japan to get ready for the introduction of casinos, which were heralded to about to be happening right. in the late 2000s. That's right. Um, 2004, 2010. Of course, we're still waiting. The Japanese very conservative approach, the police in particular. Who's, the police constitution in Japan was set up prior to the actual constitution. They were constituted in 1949. 
So they are all powerful. The MPA, only 2,000 people, were very powerful inside the Japanese government. Still cautious about implementing casinos. We'll see them eventually, maybe for 2029 or something okay. like that. But the, the idea was bubbling along. We're on the edge of it and Winds and Sands and all those guys were coming here and courting Sammy Sega and those sort of companies like that. So, and Aristocrat was one of those who was here. Well, what are we going to do while we're here? So they made pachisro machines while they're waiting. What? Pachisro. You know, so it's pachinko, which are the balls. Pachinko. pachinko so so pachisro is, pachinko. has reels. It's, they have two types in I Japan. I haven't seen that. Yeah, so the, the industry is split like 60-40. 60 for the balls, 40 for the reels. And this is actually a game of skill because you can actually time the reels by... Uh, well, very similar to a slot machine okay. in a casino. Very right. similar. Right. But these days they have sc LED screens and, and manga going on on the screen and all that sort of thing. So the, while they were um, waiting for casinos so they could put in their poker machines, the, the slot machines, um, the, uh, they were making pachislo. So it's very similar to pachinko, but just without the balls. Mm -hmm. um, in the, and in those days, um, there were 17,000 pach pachinko um, places in Japan. Um, they changed the regulation and at the same time as the, um, uh, the financial crisis in the mm -hmm. Um, that fell down to 12,000. So I was the, here running a Pachislaw manufacturing company. For Austria? If I was, yeah, I was, yeah, they had a wholly owned subsidiary here. So I was the president of the, of the wholly owned subsidiary running. A, of, and and it's, a cabal, it's not cabal, but it's in Japan. You understand that industry collaborate with each other, the industry association. So there are 27 companies that, that allowed the licenses for that sort of thing. And, and our company was allied with Sammy Sega. And, and um, we were making machines. It was the uh, Kyoji no Hoshi and um, Kyofu no Shinbun and these type of um, licensed titles from, from well-known manga, usually. Hokuto no Ken is Sammy Sega's great famous one. Um, and making these machines. But we're a tiny little company, only 100 people, and but, but about 400 million turnover. Um, uh, 7% of the supply side. So we would sell machines to the halls. So we only had about 7% of the market. That was 400, 450, $400 million turnover. So that's 7%. So you can see the size of the market in Japan. It's like, it's like $10 billion market. Just, just eat, selling them. Imagine how much the halls are making. So this was the second. Because I said to them, oh, no, I don't think I can. I wouldn't be doing that. You know, how could I get that to, but I did, I, 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 I did this and I did that, do with what you, you, I did that for a few years right. um, and uh, eventually the, the financial crisis did show that gambling wasn't a discretionary activity in the Las Vegas, had, even Las Vegas had troubles in that period. So the company shrank, its share price went from $18 to $2.80 or something like that and they, and they spread the senior executives around the globe on the wind and gave them a golden package and said you're out. So, so once again, I was footloose. At, at the end of the 2010s. And um, I went to the Gold Coast where my children were um, right. studying university at the time. Um, and um, stayed there for a little while, was doing some consulting. And I got another never say never, I got a phone call from a guy who said, you don't know me, but I know you. And, and I want you to come and work for me. And I, I just said, he was in Darwin. I don't know, so Darwin is like Alaska. It's in the far north. The it's it's four thousand kilometers to Sydney from Darwin. It's like a four-hour aeroplane trip overland, um, and it's hot. It's like Indonesia. It's like Singapore. It's they only have two seasons. The dry season. He said, "We want you to come up, and and we want you to run our investment attraction for the, the state of the Northern Territory in in Australia." And I said, oh, no, I don't think so, <laughs> because it's way up there and it's way away, tiny little population. But the state has 30% has minerals and energy direct as its economy. And they said, no, no, come up and have a talk. And we'll... I'd been there in, in the past, and um, it's like the Wild West. It really is. Fly in, fly out, enge um, mining engineers, all night pubs, that sort of thing. Um, anyway, so I, I went up there and I said, I don't think so. And they said, no, no, you... the, the minister... Um, there's, there's a very small population up there, but they said, look, you can run the program and I'll back you. And little did I know the minister wanted to do everything. He said, just tell me everything and do everything. But um, he was a great guy. So I kind of said, okay. So I, I went to Darwin for, for two years and ran the Northern Territories Investment Attraction Project program. 
Um, and, and they didn't meet resources. So we just did China, Korea, and Japan. Like that. that. And yeah, it was just that. And we, we traveled relentlessly. There's, um, it was about advocacy. It was about um, uh, raising profile. It was about providing the companies. Um, it was all about mining and energy in, in the Northern Territory. Massive reserves of, mm. of uranium and of... Um, well, Australia has a third of the world's uranium. Mm. It's a, st- a staggering figure. You're, and you know, the, the truth is that um, nuclear power is the greenest power on the planet. If we could just get it safe, it would be perfect. And Australia has a third of the uranium. The non-ferrous metals, iron ore, gold, you know, it's, it's an absolute treasure trove up there. So we were partnering with Chinese state-owned enterprises, Japanese, um, uh, Jogmec and Korea Core, is those sort of places, um, to bring investment to ca- capitalise on the minerals and energy opportunity. I was in Beijing doing the, the sort of in, uh, engagement for the investment attraction. I got a phone call saying, we want you to come and this, this, the state of Victoria looking for a, a commissioner for... Um, uh, North Asia, uh, and I and I kind of said, okay, I'll you know I'll, I'll get back there and I'll make a plan to come. They said, no, we want you to come tomorrow. So I'm in Beijing, and 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 they I did an interview on the and I flew down. It was actually the time because we hold the President's Cup often in Australia, down in Royal Melbourne, which is one of the great courses in the world. I couldn't get a, a hotel room to save my life. It was just so many people there. Um, but I went in, and I had an interview, and I met the minister, and um, we had a joke about which football team I supported and in Australia we have all we have four codes of football that we support and I was lucky enough to get the job as a commissioner for North Asia for the state of Victoria and so Victoria is so Melbourne where the Australian Open Tennis is the state around that's the state of Victoria and it's a, the, the odd man out in Australia because there are no minerals. Australia's iron ore and coal and steel and, 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 and uranium and, and non ferrous metals and stuff like that um, and LNG, of course, but in Victoria they don't have any of that. So it's the manufacturing head, headquarters of Australia, mm-hmm. um, and and we have had a, a the very first international Toyota factory was in Melbourne. In fact, in 1963, uh, and Ford and 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 um, uh, GM were there making making vehicles. Oh, not many, maybe two hundred thousand, like two Toyota factories worth, not ten or fifteen. Mm-hmm. Um, but for our population, that's what it was—the domestic. So the engineering strengths, the Australia's um, manufacturing strength, the production strength, services were all rooted inside the, the, the Melbourne, um, uh, the Victoria yeah. state. So very different proposition, very much like Japan, in fact. So Japan has none of, no resource and energy, so it's naturally enough a manufacturing and services economy which exports to the world. So very similar mapping with Victoria. So um, this is a very interesting opportunity. Um, small team, much smaller than working in the embassy. So I have six staff here in Japan and three in Korea. Um, uh, but you know you, you're right at the cold face all the time. You're doing that advocacy right up front. So that was very interesting, and um, so I started to do that um, for Victoria once again. <clears throat> um, maybe that was possibly I could have guessed I might have been doing that in the future. But the progress from from foreign affairs to tra- trade to <clears throat> running a a Pachislaw manufacturing company, being in the wild west, well north for Australia, running investment and then coming to Japan uh, was kind of um, a lot of never say never. Uh, and this, that's what you're doing right now. So I'm doing now. I've been doing that for nearly ten years now. Ten years. Do you um, enjoy it? Yeah. Um, it's be, I, I can say honestly, having worked for a bunch of states and for the federal government, the Victorian engagement is the Rolls Royce of engagement from, for Australia because it has to be. A lot of states can afford to dig it up, right? Put it on the boat, ship it, and do some education as well. You know, um, international education training. There's six hundred thousand. In non-COVID times, there are 600,000 national students studying in Australia at any time, each year. Massive, massive. You know, e- even in Victoria alone, the education sector, when it, pre-COVID, was $7 billion per year for international students coming. So uh, Victoria, on the other hand, has the breadth of... And, and they stopped making vehicles. What happened was um, GM and Ford said, we're leaving, and Toyota, as much as it wanted to keep its very first international factory, kind of was saying, well, you know, the, the Camry in Thailand is... Two thousand dollars cheaper, so Camry, so Thailand, Toyota, and Thailand, and, and Toyota Australia. That's the whole margin on a Camry. Two thousand. So they said, you know, we can't support the whole supply chain. We're out as well. So a massive change in the middle of that time where Australia stopped making automotive vehicles completely. So if you're not making Camrys, what are you doing? There's a catchphrase for Victoria, and and interestingly enough, Victoria has has been a fantastic transformation story into tech. 
the, the places in the US which are buoyant in their economy now are the ones who have said, we're going to be a tech city, we're going to provide tech infrastructure, we're going to um, bring in investment in its new format. So Victoria's done the same, and it is one of the top three bioscience cities in the world now, alongside so London and Boston. So what is it doing? It's just doing tech only? So it's well, it's not, not just. So now we're doing advanced manufacturing, so nanotech and, and new carbon, new materials, that sort of thing, on that side. But so we still have the engineering strength from the universities. Melbourne University is ranked higher than Tokyo University. Um, is that an astounding? It is. In the, so there's 10,000 odd universities listed in the list of universities. Right, right. So Melbourne is ranked like 26 and to Tokyo 30 or something like that, wow. you know, with Singapore. The, in that, uh, when you take out the, 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 the blue chip university from the US the top and, and Oxford and those ones, that, it's in that very next tranche, which I, I, I always can't believe for a city of a, a country of 27 million people to have a, a top 30 What's the percentage of foreigners coming there? Um, massive. Prior to COVID, massive. Um, because of the strength of the universities, Melbourne University. Um, well, and what was the percentage then of, of people from Austria versus? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think probably it would be half, almost. Okay. And, then, and that's a significant number. It right? is, it is, it is. A significant number. Um, but the strength of the universities and the qualification is so attractive that international students would choose Australia that's right, over that's the US. Right, that's right. The US universities don't really care about international education. They don't, no, they don't, they don't have to. If you go, they don't, they don't have, have to. to. They, they don't have, have to. to. Right. But Australia, that's this right. was a new economic model and part of it. So, right. that, so it, it provision of, of very high level international education in Asia is a magnet for. So that, that's what it became. Uh, COVID has messed that round a bit and now they're in recovery phase. But um, there are, there are, and Australia has large universities. I can say that even on the US scale. So there's only 40 in all of Australia, but the average size would be at least 40,000. Um, the largest is 80,000 student campus. <laughs> right, so they're big companies. Um, and, and, and the strength of four of those in the top 200 in, in Victoria, um, and all of them in the top 500, I think all nine of them, um, uh, is around life sciences, computer tech, IT, those sorts of things. So, you, so um, just sort of diverging a little bit, we were very happy to welcome a, a uh, well-known Japanese company to Australia recent, to recently. My job is to bring those. Mm -hmm. And and they were an AI company. Um, people know them as um, uh, as Gulliver here. Gulliver, you know yes. Gulliver? Yes. So it's actually an AI company. Um, so the company EDOM, which stands behind Gulliver, provides an AI engine so that when you walk in to Gulliver and say, how much is my car worth? In 20 minutes, they can tell you exactly. And they'll okay. back their thing because they have an AI engine plus visuals and photos, which will tell them to a payable amount that they're confident of. So, but they wanted to do US and Europe and they were struggling to find a model to, to, for end market entry. You can come to Australia and you can, you can perfect that. So they've moved their international division to Australia. They need 100, they started with 150 AI engineers. So you need the, 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 the strength of academic institutions to be able to provide that. These days you can work wherever you want to. You pop That's open your, your iPad, you can see in Singapore, you can be in, in, LA, in LA, in, in San Francisco, you can be, one up in Melbourne. So we have a very powerful university. Uh, so that they'll have, they'll, in the first year, they'll put on 150 AI engineers to grow their strength model, and they'll use that to go into Europe and into the USA. From do you see yourself continuing? How much longer do you see yourself in this area? In this, um, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to go again. Um, I, I'm on a sort of a rolling three-year contract. Okay. Um, uh, I've got another year, I think, to go on this one, and hopefully they'll renew me again. Um, but it's you know it's it's new energy it's it's, it's um, life sciences it's um, uh, infrastructure um, it's new uh, it's it's defense and, and advanced manufacturing those sorts of so hardcore um, industry opportunities and education of course they're still growing and so we want investment to come in and the 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 interesting trend from companies these days is that we've got in Japan particularly we've got same as was at the bubble we've got too much money. What are we going to do? Oh, why don't we start our own fund? So there's hundreds of funds, and Japanese um, instantly look with inside their own hut. So we're going to invest in our own projects, and then look a little bit around in Japan, very cautious. But the opportunities and the breadth of the investment opportunity they're looking for doesn't just exist in Japan. So they need to balance their basket about them and look for other opportunities for their funds. To, to, to. So um, this new channel of investment, I mean, we still want a yogurt factory. Um, bricks and mortar investment, of course, but these days more and more it's not like that. 
That's right. Um, uh, uh, PE or VC investment direct to um, startups or to another fund to concierge that and do a fund of fund service. Those sorts of models have become prevalent. The old, yes, we'll help you build a yogurt factory is valid, but it's a much smaller piece of the, the, the pie now in terms of the complex. It's very difficult for governments to manoeuvre and provide the facilitation, the entry that, that's required to land safely and get going. Um, but, you know, as I said, I'm very lucky that I can honestly sit here and say that Victoria is, because it has to be, you know, there's bipartisan support from the politicians, has to be. There's 23 offices around the world. That's a little state, right? We're talking about something that's, I mean, it's in size terms for Australia, it's the same size as Honshu, Victoria is. But with a population of about 7 million people, this, running 23 offices around the world, it is a, a significant player in the, in, the, in the world for attraction in trade and trade. But I'm working for um, uh, the gold standard. Um, you know, we, we compare ourselves to the, the Singaporeans or, or you know, the, 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 you know, the world movies. But it seems like you're pretty quiet about it, though. People don't know. Well, that's the job. I mean, the in the Northern Heritage, if I say Victoria, you go, oh, yeah, we know you guys from Canada, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but not just that, but I think Australia has always been that way. They have history that because it wasn't long after I got in the military. I, I found out that Australians have fought in every single conflict the U.S. has had. Yeah. So, so said, and nobody knew. How, you don't see anything. It's, it's it's an interesting You're story. It's like Japanese. It's, it's it's an interesting story about the relationship between Australia and U.S. Australia, because of its geographical position, needs and has always been ever since the all wars, but has felt either a link to 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 the to the U.K. and or to the U.S. after the Second World War. Um, and given our position in, in the Pacific and the, the um, uh, potential for crisis um, from some of the players in the Pacific, um, we, we very much value our relationship with the US, particularly you know, growing out of the Second World War in particular. There are bases in Australia that are joint bases. There are um, um, uh, supply chain and all that, that, that sort of thing. Um, uh, so you know, st strategically, we have always known this and the part of being looked after and in during such time is to pay the piper up front. So interestingly enough, there are more Australians killed per person That's in true. Vietnam That's right. than any other seminar. Because usually we don't send infantry. We don't have enough, but we have very good special forces. That's right. So signals of special forces, that sort of thing, cutting edge line, reconnaissance, that sort of thing. No wonder they all got, um, there was a massive uh, casualty rate. Um, so uh, Korea is the same. We're actually still at war with North Korea, same as, same as the US. Um, it's, it's, an, it's an arms, it's a uh, ceasefire. It's not. Uh, it's Australia is, um, was a federation, it, 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 right. it's uh, its own country from 1901. Um, so it's only a young country, younger than the US, if you like. Um, 100 and, uh, what, 20 years of, of independence, if you like. Um, the, prior to that, the states had direct relationships with the, with the, with the um, before nationhood, the states themselves. So Victoria had a governor um, who was appointed by Queen Victoria right, course, or whatever like that. But aren't you still part of their commonwealth? Oh yeah, of course, yeah. That's so the, That's what you're trying to get the, out don't, don't get me wrong, right. Australia and UK are tightest of friends. I know that. Um, <laughs> it's just that as, an, as a national entity, it was born from, from crisis like that mm -hmm. in the cauldron of the war from the First World War. Mm -hmm. And then um, it, it, our mateship with the US in, in, in the Pacific actions. Mm -hmm. MacArthur's headquarters in Brisbane, I know. right? And the MacArthur plan, interesting story you probably know, MacArthur's plan for the, um, for the defence of Australia, he drew a line from Brisbane to Perth. And he said, from below that, we'll defend. Above that, it's impossible. Uh, That's part of the, the birth of the relationship. You know, MacArthur's flag was in Brisbane. Um, you know, bases in the northern of Australia and the west of Australia to assist the, the, the US strategic um, presence. So um, that, that obviously makes sense to most Australians and, and it's kind of a bi bipartisan thing. Yeah. So you know we're tied to that, um, but we, but there's a, a a change from the 70s where we actually saw ourselves as an Asian country. That's right. We're here in Asia. You we're not. We're not European. Tried it, yeah. um, so instantly our immigration changed, and now 25% of the Australian population is not born in Australia. Yeah, so, oh, that, that's a India, staggering that number, yeah, right? So if you throw the parents in who have been sort of reversed immigration, so half the population not born in Australia. 
of tools. That, that is a, a fantastic change. And so Australia is, we do, the interesting part of our Australians is we don't have a word foreigner anymore. You can't walk in the street and go, <laughs> oh, there you go, the, you're here in Tokyo in the Ginza, there you go, those foreigners. Well, see, Australia has a very interesting history, as you know, when it had its all-white policy. Mm. And I think that lasted until 60 what? The end of 60s. And, and, and you can, they, the so immigrants do use the test of their choice to block people from coming right, exactly, in. And exactly. the language of their choice. They sure did. They sure um, did. Uh, but it changed. Um, the, the Labour yeah, government yeah. came in at the early 70s and, mm -hmm. and opened relationships with China um, instantly. And it was just a, it was a tumultuous time in Australia. The end of the Vietnam War, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, uh, to which, to which change, the fabric of Australian society changed, and then from then on, you did wave after wave of different areas of con concentration. The interesting part was after the Second World War, Australia became a favourite destination for people who were refugees from the from the Second World War in Europe. Right. Not exactly refugees, but right. looking to start a new. Right. The largest Greek city in the world is Athens. The second largest Greek city in the world is Melbourne. Is that right? There are more Greeks now in Melbourne, in terms of um, um, uh, their derivation, where they came from. Um, and the same with the giant Italian community. So we have, we have massive older immigration waves directly after the right, war, right, Scottish, right. Irish. Uh, right, right. And Australia is, has um, one of the problems or one of the characteristics of Australia is that we have egalitarianism. We all think we're the same. You call the president of the company by his first name, Jack, Jack how are you, mate? Good to see you again. You know, um, not you know Yamada san <laughs> Sama, you know Chacho Sama. There's none of that. Um, and it's because we have so much Irish in our. Um, Australia was a penal colony of, of, of the UK. Yes, that's, that's the beginning. So we had a lot of larrikans and 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 we had the 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 the, 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 the Irish spirit. Right. So Canine, my name is actually O'Coinan. Okay. It's it's an Irish derivation, and the Irish are the princes of, of egalitarianism and not wanting to be put down by the by the UK. So that's in our hereditary, and that's in our blood. So Australia is very flat. In reality, maybe it's not, but but we like to think that we are very flat and egalitarian. Everyone is equal. Every chance is is the same for everyone in Australia. Obviously, it's not in every country. There but that was a big. That's a but big, that big, that's it, a big more that's than anywhere else in, in in the world, I suspect. You can be eating, as we do at the, at the football, a meat pie and calling the president of a company mate, um, having a beer with them. Um, that's just how Australia is. And, and, I, and I kind of think that's part of our success internationally. So many of our uh, 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 good executives are employed by major corporations around the world because their engagement skills, their soft skills are just naturally grown mm -hmm. from, from being equal to people all the way through and treating people the same as them. Oh. Australia, like the US, does have its own indigenous culture and, and Australia has, carries the same guilt. It, it wasn't me, but 200 years ago, uh, when in, um, horrendous things, and even you know, well into the 19th, um, horrendous things were being done to our indigenous population. Indigenous population is about 2% of our population. Right. Um, so, but we are very conscious that, that they are the, the indigenes, they are the first people well, here you, in their culture. 40,000 years old. <coughs> you're suffering through what America suffers with, with its indigenous people. Yeah. So we're, same thing. we're trying to celebrate that now. And, and we're trying to grow that as, as, as a mature the place. There are some terrible, every country's got the same story about what they've done to the indigenous people. But Australia is trying to address that as, as, mm -hmm. as best as it can, which is wonderful. But yeah, um, uh, Australia is a safe place. Pr pretty safe. It is, um, it is. That's why students choose Australia sometimes over the US. For that's right. I understand. I understand. I understand. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, what is an Aussie? It's that egalitarian um, optimism. When I came to interesting story, when I came to Japan, they said, "What well, blood type are you?" And I said, "Well, how would I know that? Who knows what their blood type is?" I mean, but, but I found out it's a thing. In Japan, in but but also you know they they attribute personality characteristics. If you're an A, which is most yeah. of Japan, forty percent, right. then you're focused, then you're you know concentrated, which is very Japanese. Australians are more than forty percent O. Only the Spanish are the same. So you get that feeling of that we well, should be right, take it easy. So I kind of thought maybe there's something to it after Possibly. all. So I'm O as well. So am I. Um, and I guess if you're looking for people who are easy and laid back and, and good for engagement, that sort of thing, you're probably going to find them amongst a bunch of O's. <laughs> That's a good note for us to end on. Yeah. I want to ask you one question before sure. we finish, Adam. I ask this of everyone. Sure. Would you consider a good life in Japan? What, what is a good life in Japan? Would you consider a good life in Japan? I, I, I think I'm, I have a good life in Japan. I think um, 
I like to live in the city. I, 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 it's a, there's an energy in, to, in Tokyo. It's a giant megalopolis, and you draw the energy like that. But I can be playing golf in Chiba within an hour. Um, the the climate is really. I love the because I grew up without climate, without four seasons. I love the autumn. You know, and not so much the winter, but the beautiful autumn, the beautiful spring. I love that. Um, and the, the food, of course. You know, the, the, the normal Japanese restaurants like a four-star restaurant anywhere else in the world. So, food, the safety. Um, uh, I mean, you have to set aside the, the sacrifice you make to the harmony of society. In other words, rules and restrictions, um, which don't make any sense sometimes um, to get that. But the safety, the harmony, the politeness, the, the, the uh, variety, the food, the people are, are warm and engaging, you know. So, uh, you know, life is pretty good in Japan, I think. That's true. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Okay. I want to thank all of you for watching this podcast. Make sure you press like and subscribe. And make sure you take care of your voice like I should be taking care of mine because I don't know what it is. But remember, it's all unknown, so continue to reach for the stars because you're too blessed to be stressed.